So you just went grocery shopping, and you bought everything you needed for a nice dinner for four people. But you go back home, and there's actually six of you. So you take the car, and you go back to the grocery store, only to find that it's empty. You move to the next grocery store, and then the supermarket, and then the department stores, but all the shelves are empty. Now, this is a simple metaphor of what may happen to us in just 33 years from now. We know that presently in the world, more than one billion people suffer from starvation. The world, the land area of the world, is approximately 13,000 million acres, and just 37.6 percent of that is agricultural area. It's mainly dedicated to pastures and growing food for cattle, and biofuel. Just a small portion is, is arable area. Now, since the 1950s, some two billion hectares of this area have been de determined degraded, which means that it falls out of the possibility of growing food. Pollution, desertification, urban encroachment, all these account for further reducing our availability of land. So more people, less land, higher demand for food. Where are we potentially headed? Well, I read once that by 2050, given the growth in population predicted, the same level of starvation and the present ways of agriculture, we will need to find an area the size of Brazil to feed the world. This might be an exaggerated statement, but nonetheless, it left me speechless. Now, agriculture is both a basic need of man, but also a very dangerous activity for our environment. In fact, agriculture is one of the biggest um, culprit of global warming. It emits more greenhouse gases than our trucks, cars, planes combined. Farming is one of the thirstiest users of our precious water supplies. And agriculture is the culprit of the loss of biodiversity in the world in these centuries that have passed. What would you think if I were to tell you that farms in the US alone have been producing 262% more food than they were producing in the 1950s? And what if I were to tell you that these same farms are expected to produce 60% more to meet the further increasing global demand? How does that make you feel? It makes me feel scared. I mean, just by traveling, you can see how deeply we have ravaged our Earth. I can't imagine how much more we can... devastation we can bring upon us when faced with food scarcity. So, on a planet that is more than 71 percent water, why not turn to the oceans? Because water is salty, because plants can't live in it? Well, it does make sense, honestly, but follow me here in this, in this exercise. I myself am a surfer. Not a very good one, evidently, but I have a deep connection. My family has always had a deep connection with the ocean. It's a passion that has been passed on to me from my dad. I have scuba dived since I was nine years old. So it is only natural that my dad, a chemical engineer with a passion in growing plants and uh, undoubtedly a few loose screws, would want it to try and experiment growing plants in the water. Why would we do that? First, we need to understand what the plants need. And it's basically four factors. Plants need temperature stability. It's not surprising that agriculture was born in those areas of the world where temperature excursions between day and night and during the season is not a, that extreme. So plants don't like low temperatures, they don't like too high temperatures. Plants also need water. 
and that is not a groundbreaking discovery. Uh, we know that. Plants need sunlight to perform the transformation of CO2 into O2, and vice versa in what is commonly known as the night and day cycle. And last, but certainly not least, plants need safety. They need to be protected from parasites, critters, and us mammals, and also harsh weather conditions. Now, these four elements, though simple and straightforward, are not that easy to find in the world, and especially they're not easy to be scalable upon, reliable upon. In fact, human beings have so deeply um, shaped the landscape of our planet to face the need in increasing yield and stability of our food. So we think that these four simple elements can be found actually underwater. And how is that possible? Well, we said that plants need water. Water comes from evaporation. Evaporation happens all the time. It's not only when we boil water. Uh, the surface of the ocean is made of molecules of water that slowly but surely move into the above air volume. And by doing that, they lose their content in salt and minerals. So if we have a surface of water, even if it's under the sea level, we will have evaporation. We will have fresh water for the plants. We need temperature stability, we said before. Well, water has much higher heat capacity than air. In fact, air warms up and cools down so much faster than water. Temperate cities are usually close to big bodies of water. And third, we need safety. Well, there is no natural foe that can reach the plants underwater. It's simply not there. So based on these three simple intuitions, we embarked on a journey that, of course, started with some spectacular failures. But through pers perseverance, stubbornness, we successfully grew plants underwater. And how did we do that? How did we harness these elements that are underwater? Well, we engineered these transparent domes filled with air and anchored to the seafloor. And we call them biospheres. Inside these biospheres, we uh, designed a system of hydroponic culture. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but hydroponics main focus is to get rid of the soil, which makes sense. We learned before that soil is actually a very scarce resource in the world. Inside these biospheres, we also have a tech box. This tech box has Wi-Fi connection and a bunch of sensors that we can use to remotely check the conditions in the biospheres. It's also equipped with remotely activated pumps, lights, and fans in case we need to interact with the environment just like a normal greenhouse. The initial start to the biosphere is given by just a normal scuba tank that is opened underneath this biosphere. So we open it, air comes out, water that is in is driven out, and that's how we create an air volume inside the biospheres underwater. Fairly simple. The atmosphere inside these biospheres is not different from what you're breathing now. The only difference is the pressure is increased given to the depth that we decided to install our biosphere. So putting the things back together, we don't need soil because we're hydroponic. Temperature is given by the surrounding body of water. Protection is given by the fact that we're underwater. And we have natural evaporation, which provides us of the fresh water that we need to make it circle into the hydroponic system. And how do we power all of this? We started years ago with landline electricity. But for a, for a sustainable project, it doesn't really make sense. So we installed a windmill and solar panels. And I'm very proud to say now that almost all the energy that we use in Nemo's garden is green. What is the purpose of this project, Nemo's Garden? There are multiple. We've been discovering more and more along the way. But there's one 
which is the highest purpose of them all, I believe, and is the reason why I'm here talking to you today. We believe that we can give an option to us, to every one of us, to feed those extra guests without having to move to Mars. We deeply and firmly believe that in a planet that is 71% oceans, it is only natural that the future of sustainability will be in the oceans. We should work with what we have here, be imaginative, creative. I see, I imagine, I see thousands of these pods, these biospheres, that contribute to create food in those countries that lack arable land, that have extreme temperatures, that don't have the infrastructure, that don't have fresh water. I see these biospheres connected to other exciting projects such as artificial reefs and coral restoration and biofuel algae farms, clam farms, mussel farms. I see Nemo's garden being connected to agriculture, I'm sorry, aquacultures, where the biological waste of fish farms is used as a nutrient for the plants and plants in the biospheres are used as a nutrient for the fish. Just imagine how many places in the world that could benefit from Nemo's Garden, from biospheres everywhere. We could put them in lakes, we could put them in lagoons, along the shorelines, without having to burn down forests to create arable land, without having to use precious fresh water for irrigation, without having to destroy the land to create the irrigation ways, and without having to pollute by using pesticide to guarantee a safe yield. So, I think that we have to go back to where it all started. Doesn't it make sense to go back where life started? Life started in the first place in the oceans, in the water. And there is a statement that I have read on National Geographic that I think really pinpoints the moment. We are faced, this is a pivotal moment, we are faced with unprecedented challenges in food scarcity and the protection of the global environment. We know what we have to do, but we need to figure out how to do it. And I think that Nemo's garden may be an answer to that. Thank you.